Hello everyone, I'm Dean Willow Bay of the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. We are thrilled to have you all with us today and we're even more excited to have this remarkable group of women joining us. This is the third in our series celebrating the legacy of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which we've called Her Story, a title particularly fitting for today's topic. So by way of background, the morning after Justice Ginsburg passed away, three deans from the Gould School of Law, Price School of Public Policy in Annenberg, me, got on a call, a Saturday morning call and said, how can we come together and honor the extraordinary accomplishments of RBG, which spans so many of our fields and our disciplines. By that afternoon, Dornsife was added to the mix and the first event was scheduled. So as we conclude this look back, we turn to the image of RBG forged by her work and by the media about her. As you all know, she became a media darling, a pop cultural icon, not something Supreme Court justices usually do. So now I'm going to turn to Lisa Picot Ebert to introduce our guest. But before I do, I just want to thank Amy Antelis, who's not with us today. She's the Vice President of Talent and Content Development at CNN. She was the first person that I reached out to to organize today's panel. And we're sorry she's not here, but we are really grateful for her help in organizing this event, but even more grateful that she helped to bring RBG to all of us. So Lisa. Lisa Picot Ebert, our Associate Professor and Director of our Master's Program in Journalism. She is a journalist and a video storyteller who truly understands the power of stories to change lives. And if there's any question uh, about um, her affection for the justice, well, Jim Yoder, I think you'll uh, help um, by popping up this picture just give you a little sense of uh, how deep Lisa's fandom goes. She posted this picture um, on the morning after the justice passed away. Lisa, thank you. Great to see you and, and thanks for moderating this conversation. Thanks so much, Willow. I appreciate it. It's actually my, my honor that day that I uh, posted that photo was my birthday. And I also went to class like that on Zoom to honor RBG and all that she has accomplished for women like myself to pave the way for equality. So um, I'm really so happy to be here with all of you this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are in the uh, in the world. So I am very uh, excited to introduce you to our panelists. As Dean Bay said, this is the third uh, conversation. And this conversation is called RBG and the Making of a Media Icon. We are going to explore the legacy of her story, her rise to as a popular feminist icon, as well as her impact on how we discover, produce, and disseminate her stories. So without further ado, I will introduce our panelists and then we will get right to it today. So Julie Cohen is a documentary filmmaker and television news producer. Julie is co-director and co-producer of the Oscar-nominated and Emmy award-winning documentary RBG and the founder of Better Than Fiction, a production company based in Brooklyn, New York. She has directed and produced eight other documentaries and was a staff producer for Dateline NBC for nine years, where she was also nominated for four National Emmy Awards. She holds two master's degrees, one from Yale Law School and the other from Columbia School of Journal of Columbia Journalism School, excuse me, where she teaches in the documentary department. Julie, welcome. Great to be here. Hello. Next, we have Betsy West. Betsy is a video journalist and filmmaker with three decades of experience in news and documentaries. She also co-produced and co-directed the RBG um, documentary with Julie. West, uh, Betsy was an executive producer of the Makers documentary and digital project and the feature documentary, The Lavender Scare. As a producer and executive at ABC News, she received 21 Emmy Awards and two DuPont Columbia Awards for her work on Nightline, Primetime Live, and one of my all-time favorite documentary programs, Turning Point. As senior VP at CBS News, she oversaw 60 Minutes and 48 Hours and was in charge of the CBS documentary, 9-11. She is the Fred W. Friendly Professor of Professional Practice at Columbia Journalism School. So welcome, Betsy. Thank you, Lisa. You're welcome. 
And we have Michaela Persons Wickham. She is an entertainment attorney and associate at the law firm of Fox Rothschild based here in Los Angeles. Michaela is also a USC Annenberg alumna who earned her undergraduate degree in broadcast and digital journalism. She brings not only her expertise as a lawyer for clients across the entertainment industry, but also her experience as a student interning in marketing and PR for companies like Universal Pictures and creating her own documentary. Welcome, Michaela. Thank you, Lisa. Happy to be here. Great. We are so happy to have you all here this morning. So I just wanted to start with a little bit of context on, on RBG and then ask all of the panelists, just open it up to um, all of you, whoever would like to, to sort of answer my, my first question. So US Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away on September 18th, nearly uh, a month and a half ago at the age of 87. And she left a legal legacy while becoming an unexpected pop icon sort of later in life. Her unique personal journey to, um, to the nation's highest court was, was largely unknown, including to, to myself, someone who uh, has, has admired her for years, but I didn't necessarily know her personal story. And uh, the RBG documentary sort of explores a lot of that and how she sort of became this, uh, this notorious NB, um, RBG. So she became the social media icon in the 80s, and the term notorious RBG obviously played off of the, the, um, the rapper Notorious B.I.G. They were both from Brooklyn, and it, part of the movie, uh, she chuckles and talks about, well, we're both from Brooklyn, so you know, clearly we, are, we have something in common, which I thought was very sweet. And the name came, uh, was coined by an NYU law student who admired Ginsburg and admired her dissent in the Shelby Counter versus Holder case, which basically was a, was a case um, that cut back on a key civil rights issue, the, the Voting Rights Act. So RBG said, race-based voting discrimination still exists. And she criticized the court's conservative for getting rid of part of this landmark decision, the Voting Rights Act in, in 2013, which is sort of when the RBG moniker, the notorious RBG moniker came up. So my question to all of you is, how do you think, or in your opinion, how do you think RBG was able to steer clear, I guess, of this media icon status until the 80s, even though she had made all of these strides for women and equality, but somehow this this notorious RBG that came about and, and was wildfire on, on social media really is what kind of pump, prompted her to become this, this social media icon for people that were, were younger. What do you all think about that? Well, um, you know, I'll, I'll take a stab at it at, at the beginning, Lisa. I mean, you're right that um, a lot of the work that Ruth Bader Ginsburg did as a lawyer in the 1970s, arguing cases before the US Supreme Court really did change the world for American women. I mean, she really had such an impact, but it wasn't a story that was widely known beyond the legal community. And, you know, I started uh, working on stories involving the modern women's rights movement, and Julie and I both worked on a project about that in the in around 2009, 10, and 11, that's when I first learned about what she had done um, back in the 70s. I mean, most people just knew she was the second woman on the US Supreme Court. Then when these uh, decisions came down, these conservative decisions that you mentioned, you know, the, the uh, Shelby County and, and then Hobby Lobby, and she was issuing very fierce dissents. That's when she, she took off. I mean, basically, before that, she's kind, she was a, a very sort of shy and, um, you know, retiring and quiet person. She was not in the forefront of the feminist movement. She wasn't out there marching with um, Gloria Steinem and, and uh, the other members of the women's movement, but behind the scenes, she was doing as much as anyone had done before for women's equality. And, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to do the film to, 
kind of look at that history, but also, you know, playing off the fact that she had become this icon that people really gravitated to her opinions that she, she issued later on in, in her career. You know, there's a, this interesting question of how people become so celebrated pop culture figures, especially people in the political or legal world where frankly that doesn't happen too often. It's important to remember that like the people that we're paying the most attention to uh, on the news or particularly on social media are not necessarily the most important figures who are making the biggest difference. I mean, if, if, if that were the case, then like the most important American would probably be Kim Kardashian and, you know, bless her heart, but I actually <laughs> don't think she's the most uh, important person in terms of making, uh, you know, ch changing a, a society. It's like th things catch on for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they're pretty arbitrary. In the case of RBG's descent in the Shelby County case, it wasn't so much that it was hugely important, which it was, but the reason it became such a big deal was because it was written in a less legal than usual way. Justice Ginsburg was careful, particularly in writing her dissents, um, to be writing not just for other judges and all other lawyers, but also to be writing so that human beings could understand. She felt that what the court had done was a huge problem for, for society, that like stripping away some of the voting rights protections that had been in place since 1965 because they were working was no good. And the way that she wrote that in her dissent, she was kind of trying to reach past the lawyers to people who wanted to know what's the significance of the deci this decision. And she said the great line that stripping away these protections because they were working is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet. That line was so good and struck people who were concerned about the loss of voting rights protections really strongly. And, you know, as a result, people started, people and young people in particular, started sharing this and started talking about what the Supreme Court had done and how problematic it was, exactly what RBG wanted to happen. What she hadn't anticipated was that it was also going to lead people to, you know, in effect say, like, oh, you know, that Supreme Court justice, she's really a badass, you know, that that was sort of, and and like, that wasn't wrong. Like she was really like, she was really kind of doinking um, her her friend and colleague and, you know, the, the, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Roberts, who had, who had written that decision by saying like, no, you're, you're totally wrong. And like, you know, her, her dissent was kind of like a, a mic drop type thing. And, and people took it that way. And that's why, that, that, that was the beginning of all of the memes and the like, oh, let's take her picture and put a little crown on it and say, you can't spell truth without Ruth and, you know, yeah. and the notorious RBG, which of course was just meant as a joke, but like it was a joke that was funny. It was a joke that she enjoyed, that she kind of amped up by, as you pointed out, Lisa, making making the, the, the good quip, like, oh no, you know, me and B.I.G. had so much in common. We were both born and bred in Brooklyn. I mean, RBG was super proud of being a Brooklyn girl. So, uh, you know, and it just kind of took off from there. And I think, um, my Caitlin, I will let you, you chime in on that as well. But it was funny because I was talking to my son who was 23, just for context. And I said, you know, what do you think about RBG? I was speaking to him and his girlfriend. He's, and they both were like, oh, she's a savage. Which <laughs> basically for those that don't know what that means. Um, in, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> for the modern day people, um, like she's she's a badass, right? So what yeah. Julie's, that's, that's like our version of what badass is. Yeah. Um, today. And I was like, oh, okay, that's great. Cause I just wanted to, and I said, but, but why? And he was like, well, I mean, you know, like she just did all this stuff for equality and she just was so cool and the way she talked and all these different things. And it was just, you know, it was very interesting to hear as a, as a mom and as someone that is, uh, that admired her to hear from my son, this badass, you know, kind of savage status. Um, even when he had probably never read any of her dissents like he literally was introduced to her from social media which i thought was just such an interesting phenomenon i, I thought it was was so interesting and michaela i know you you kind of you work in that intersection of you know law and pr and social media and space yeah. and so what what is your take on 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 the notorious rbg and how this how this sort of came to be 
I really think it's incredible the way the Notorious RBG moniker spread throughout social media. I mean, it's been incredible to see the way that millennials and other young people have been exposed to her work. And I think the use of social media and blogs like Tumblr and Twitter and Instagram, all of that to spread the word about someone who it who was so incredibly powerful, but that so many young people may not have even been aware of um, is really powerful. And I think that in today's age where so many teenagers and other young people are on social media looking for kind of quick bites of information, quick things that they can cling on to, um, there's so much short form content out now I think that looking at all of the memes and the notorious RBG moniker, it really spread throughout social media. And I think it, it caused a lot of young people to take a step back and say, who is this woman? Oh, she's this pioneer who's been fighting for women's equality, for equality of all people. Um, and this is someone who is actually an, a real life influencer and someone who is truly influential in the, the landmark decisions that influence what we can do in our day-to-day -day lives. I remember when I was in law school, every time we read a dissent by Justice Ginsburg, there was buzz in the classroom, buzz outside of the classroom, yeah. um, because it fostered debate and it fostered a sense of here's a way to, here's an example of how you can vehemently disagree but also connect with those who have different opinions. Um, and I think that, that RBG really embodied that in her work and in her, in her lifestyle. I think she had a very positive um, relationship with the media. And there's a great moment in the documentary where um, she's watching the depiction of herself on SNL by Kate McKinnon and she's just laughing and so joyously receiving it and having that moment of humor and looking at the beauty of what of what media can do. And I, I think it's great that a lot of people who might not have otherwise um, been exposed to her work for whatever reason, um, were able to see the the fighter that she was um, in the legal community and in the, in the world at large, really. Absolutely. You know, I, I just want to add to that Justice Ginsburg wasn't somebody who used social media. I mean, she wasn't on Twitter. And, you know, when this first happened, when this notorious RBG first happened, I think it was her clerks who had to explain to her that she was kind of blowing up on the internet. And in a way she had a choice, you know, she could have recoiled from the whole thing in horror or she just kind of accepted it. And I think understood in a, very profound way that it was an opportunity to do exactly what you said, Michaela, to reach people who wouldn't otherwise be reading Supreme Court decisions, but with these fundamental ideas that she believed in about the rule of law, about you know the equality for all people in our country. These were concepts that she understood she could spread. And so she got a kick out of it, as, as I think Julie said, and um, you know, didn't discourage it. In fact, she had a little, little bag she used to carry around with her with stuff inside of it, like Alin had said, I dissent. It was her I dissent purse we used to see her with. And, she, you know, she uh, definitely saw the value in reaching a wider audience through social media. Absolutely. And, and her dissents were kind of what gave her that, uh, that savage status, so to speak, right? T toward, toward the end. And um, there's a quote I have from her that I wrote down that she basically, um, many of her dissents were aimed at swaying the opinions of the, her fellow judges and were an appeal to the intelligence of another day, as she says, in hopes that they would provide guidance for future courts. And I think that that is so profound because even when you may have lost something, right? Maybe you have, you know, but you are providing a, a dissenting argument you, she had the wherewithal to understand that this was not just a momentary thing, that her words would live on and that her words would have value beyond the moment. And I think that's for me, what was so fascinating about RBG is that she almost had, had an intelligence to know 
everything I'm doing right now and every word that I'm saying right now may or may not affect change at this moment, but I know what I'm doing and I'm thinking about the future and I'm planting that seed in everyone's sort of brain about here, here's what could be. And I'm just letting you know that I'm just a few years ahead, ahead of you. And I thought that, um, that that came out very, very well um, in the documentary, just about her, about her, her personality. And I thought that that probably also plays into um, why she was, she was just, you know, so embraced through the media and through popular culture. And, it's almost and, by, like, people, and by people much younger than herself. I mean, exactly. you're absolutely right. Uh, RBG was always playing the long game. Her whole career, she was thinking, you know, three or four chess moves ahead. And I think that's not unique to her. That's true of the best lawyers and advocates and educators. Um, RBG, very specifically, um, before she was a justice, when she was a lawyer advocating for women's equal rights under the Constitution. Uh, she very deliberately modeled her strategy after Thurgood Marshall, who had done the same thing fighting for racial equality, but ba basically two decades uh, ahead of her, um, and who was playing a long game uh, his, his whole legal career, thinking, not just thinking like, oh, what's this case, but thinking how could this case build on the next case, build on the next case, build on the next case. He had amassed this whole string of victories that advanced civil rights hugely in this country, but incrementally. And she's looking to do something similar and thought like, oh, what's the best way to, to advance gender equality? Like, I, I've got a great model and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna follow that. And that's what she did, both of them, succeeded, in, interestingly, both of them ended up as, as Supreme Court justices. And both of them, you know, s as you said, spoke to the future. Like she was speaking, she was speaking to the future her whole career. Absolutely. Um, and let's, let's take a, a look at that. Jim, I'm gonna have you play clip two, what I'm calling clip two. Um, RBG was known for saying anger is a waste of time. Uh, and she used her words, she used her words and her knowledge of the law to, to fight against discrimination of all kinds, but particularly for gender equality. So let's just watch this clip and then talk about how RBG used words to affect change. Female citizens of Louisiana are denied equal protection by the total absence of their peers from the jury. I thought the and new theory was that there's very little difference between men and women, and so why wouldn't the men jury be there? Well, I'm not aware of that new theory. They didn't get it. They didn't understand the issues that women were facing, or they didn't see them as issues. Because women had, in their minds, women had a place, and it wasn't where Ruth Ginsburg was suggesting that it ought to be. Men and women are persons of equal dignity, and they should count equally before the law. You won't settle for putting Susan B. Anthony on the new dollar. Right? <laughs> <laughs> when they would say things like this, how did you respond? Well, never in anger, as my mother told me. That's, that would have been self-defeating. Always as an opportunity to teach. I did see myself as kind of a kindergarten teacher in those days because the judges didn't think so sex discrimination existed. Well, one of the things I tried to plant in their minds was think about how you would like the world to be for your daughters and granddaughters. The gender line helps to keep women not on a pedestal, but in a cage. Okay, very, very powerful clip. I, I love that she felt she said that she felt like a kindergarten teacher. Um, well, that was our one. Of, that was really our favorite soundbite. I think. Oh, really? Well, teacher. when she said it, it was like, no, not just a teacher, but a kindergarten teacher. You know, and and that is really how she approached the challenge of um, overcoming really centuries of assumptions about women, not only laws, customs feelings about women being in a second class status. And she realized it was just part of the air that, that everybody breathes and that she had to slowly bring people along. Um, as you said, 
you know, it's not so much anger is a waste of time. It was more that okay, it's okay to be angry, but then you have to go beyond that and you have to think about, well, what am I going to do with my anger? How am I going to channel my anger in a way that's, you know, going to bring other people uh, to agree with me? And, and she, uh, you know, was very strategic in, as, as Julie suggested, in the way that she approached that. Absolutely. And RBG, she ruled in favor of same-sex marriage, abortion rights, and unequal pay for women. Do you think that, and this is for all, all, all three of the panelists, do you think that RBG was a champion for people who often felt like perhaps their interests weren't um, being taken seriously by lawmakers? So in other words, do you think that her cultural icon status played into an America that was changing, but often didn't see those changes reflected in our legal system. And so they now had sort of a, a voice. I'll take that. I think that, I think she certainly was an advocate for people who felt that their voice was not heard. I mean, it largely started with women, but it became all people, minorities and, and people who felt disenfranchised and otherwise um, not heard. And I think from her perspective and her choices, like we discussed, being very strategic about how she's affecting that change, her choice to say, okay, I could go protest or I can use you know, some of the legal skills that I have. And, and she made the choice to um, litigate before she was on the court. And then when she was on the court, really taking those decisions seriously. But I think that her choices as a woman, a woman um, took a lot of patience and a lot of um, discretion in deciding to be the one who's always disagreeing. The documentary talks about how she didn't set out to be this dissenter, this notorious person that's writing a scathing dissent, but sticking to her values and staying consistent with what she believed was um, the way that things should be and fighting for something as simple as equality, which we all now acknowledge is, is a wonderful thing and a necessary thing, but in a time when the majority felt differently, I think it really took leadership on her part to be the only one dissenting or disagreeing or presenting a new perspective and having to do so in a very patient, graceful manner um, in front of a panel of of men. So I would say that she certainly was pushing for the rights of those who were disenfranchised um, and those who were just simply not really heard and, and weren't ever considered to be those who should have a voice. Right. And how do you all think the, um, how do you think the media played upon this sort of iconic status? Because she, it grew from social media, right? But the media media, the traditional media, really played played into this. Um, how, do, how do you think their role in, in shaping the notorious part of the RBG came to be? Yeah, well, you know, there's an interesting ecosystem now, the way that things flow and sort of pinball like ping back between social media, entertainment media, like Saturday Night Live and the traditional news media. I mean, at a certain point, something starts getting so much attention in these sort of more pocket niche type areas that the regular old media, who after all is also on social media and also watching SNL starts to join in too. I mean, the truth is the traditional media um, doesn't always cover the Supreme Court that much because of the difficulty of there not being cameras in the courtroom. And even though there are those great audio recordings which we use so much in the film, they don't come out that quickly. Like you can't, um, the, the audio of today's Supreme Court argument is not online often for a, for, for a number of weeks or even months. I think that's changing somewhat, but like, so uh, as a result, the whole like, the, you know, the, the, these great dissents got, I'm not saying they got zero attention in the traditional media, they got some, but they got more attention on social media. And then the whole vibe, which, you know, Kate McKinnon is picking up on and then because it had an entertaining uh, side to it, I think uh, that that just that just made it more of a thing with the media. And because Justice Ginsburg herself did not run away from this, as Betsy says, but very smartly saw like, no, this is 
this is what I'm trying, like I'm trying to reach young people for them to understand the law. Like if the, like, I don't know about this Tumblr thing that people are on or like <laughs> Instagram meme, like what does that mean? <laughs> but like, but like if it's, if it's a new avenue for educating people, she was, she was all for it. And then, so if she's talking about, you know, she would often make little jokes about herself and the notorious thing. And, and then, you know, that's sometimes at events that the regular media is covering. So people, it was like, she was a way in almost to these complex issues that are, that are hard to talk about. Mm -hmm. Is that why um, you all included a, a few scenes in the in the documentary of her speaking to was it a high school group? Yes, students? it was a group of high school students from St. Louis. Okay. Uh, yes. And I they were meeting her, her interaction with and they were meeting with her and also with Justice Thomas. They were on a trip to Washington and they were doing a kind of ecumenical study of the law and she was talking to them. Okay. Yeah. I loved that in the interaction that she had with them and she was making, again, I always loved history. So I was kind of that history nerd in school, but I would say most of my peers were not. Um, and she was, she made history meaningful, meaning the way that she was describing the constitution and she was explaining how the Supreme Court decisions could affect their lives. I thought that was extremely powerful and, um, you know, just sort of spoke to her, her love of the law, but also her love of teaching and, and young people. And I thought that um, those, those were such powerful scenes to me in, yeah. in the film. And, and she was very devoted to talking to young people. I mean, that, it was extremely important to her to, mm -hmm. to, uh, to meet with young people. She did a lot of that, that kind of, um, of teaching and she, she called it, frankly, it was, kind, it was teaching. Absolutely. So um, I just want, also want to remind, we are at the halfway point. I want to remind everyone out there that you all can put questions into the chat. So please make sure that you do that. We are going to leave the last uh, 15 minutes for, um, for Q and A so that you all can ask our panelists all of your burning questions. So please make sure you all do that. I want to pivot a little bit to, um, sort of where we are today in, in our justice system. So we are in a moment and, and Gould, the first series, the first in the RBG series talked a lot about this. Amy, Amy um, Comey Barrett, Coney Barrett has been, um, she has had hearings, right? And we are um, in, in a moment where the Supreme Court has has received another woman on onto the court, but but a, a woman who has who has very different views from um, from RBG. So what I want to do is I want to play her hearing. I want to play a clip from the movie that you all included, and it was something sort of a through line that you all could continue to go back to her hearing. And talk a little bit about that in the context of where we are today. So, Jim, if we could play clip one, that would be great. In my lifetime, I expect to see three, four, perhaps even more women on the high court bench. Women not shaped from the same mold, but of different complexions. I surely would not be in this room today without the determined efforts of men and women who kept dreams of equal citizenship alive. I have had the great good fortune to share life with a partner, truly extraordinary for his generation, a man who believed at age 18 when we met, that a woman's work, whether at home or on the job, is as important as a man's. So, so many important things in that clip. First, I want everyone to know that RBG was confirmed 96 to 3. So, which was a huge, um, I mean, everyone was, was in favor. And her her hearing, as I understand it, you all will be able to speak to this, Julian Betsy, much, much better than I can. 
her hearings, you know, while not exciting, no one loves watching hearings, uh, Supreme Court justice hearings, but her hearings were a little bit different in that she just, she really put her, herself out there, including with Marty and her relationship. And she's like, I am who I am, right? This, this is who I am. This is what I'm bringing to the table. And hopefully you will, you will all kind of vote me in and, and be on that same page. And 96 to three is, is an overwhelming majority. So I'm, I'm going to ask sort of two questions. The first is, um, why did you all think that that those, those scenes, because you went back to the hearing kind of a few two few times, I felt like it was a through sort of a through line in the movie. Why, why uh, I guess artistically did you all choose to do that? And then I will pivot to how how do you all think? Um, I'm curious to know what you think RB would think of the hearings that just passed, um, which absolutely were not 96. To just say that. Um, so. I mean, I'll take the first part of that question, which is the easy part. Right. Um, you know, I, I can certainly credit our genius editor, Carla Gutierrez, who screened every second of what was it, three or four days of hearings for Justice Ginsburg. I think it was three. And, you know, she said to us, look, a lot of it was dry. And, and tedious as you would expect, but there are moments when she is so forcefully presenting herself, you know, her mission state, who she is, where she came from, what she believes in, that Car it was Carla who suggested that we would st structure the film around some of those moments. So, you know, that's what we wound up doing. She introduces her background as an immigrant, you know, her, her, her love of Marty, you know, her lot, so many of the things that shaped her, the challenges that she faced as a young woman. And she also, um, while she certainly evaded her chair of questions about how she might rule in the future, she was, which has, you know, become a tradition for uh, uh, nominees. She was very forthright in talking about reproductive rights, for example, and about upholding uh, Roe v. Wade, that decision. So she didn't shy away, shy away from that. But from an artistic point of view, it was just, it was so powerful. Uh, and and it, it gave us the ability to kind of weave these various stories in throughout the, throughout the film. So that's, that's part one. <laughs> Yeah. Um, there you go, Julie. You get part two. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little. It's a little hard to say. I mean, yeah. well, we know, we know some things. We know that Justice Ginsburg made it clear to her granddaughter, you know, as, as she was dying, that her her one deep wish on her deathbed was that a new justice wouldn't be appointed um, until there was a new president. So uh that that speaks for itself i mean it is interesting in that context to watch that soundbite where she's talking about wanting to see more women in the court which she interestingly uses the phrase where you know of different complexions where i'm which could have meant a lot of things i mean i'm certain a certain i mean maybe she was being literal and saying she wanted you know racially diverse women but i think she actually may have meant across the political spectrum like i, I think that which was actually something that that meant something to her that that said i can't, I can't imagine uh that that amy coney barrett would have would have been her pick for a justice i think it's a, it's a little hard to say what she would uh how she would respond on the hearings it's, it's actually always a complicated dance um when a nominee for justice does uh their senate confirmation hearings more so than ever in this case which in itself might be an argument not to have held the hearings right now in this unbelievably tense political moment where a lot of the senators on both sides were kind of using the attention to the hearings as an opportunity to bring up um, some of the kind of high stakes politics beyond cases that are coming before the court, particularly on, you know, the ACA, Obamacare. Um, like, I, you know, you can't imagine her feeling, her feeling great about, about the confirmation hearings. Um, you know, she had spoken of, of a wish that they would be, that would be Come less of a partisan thing. I think that's like a wish. <laughs> like it's hard to see things. I mean, you know, not only was Justice Ginsburg overwhelmingly confirmed, Justice Scalia was unanimously confirmed. Right. You know, with some, someone who idea, which is actually even more shocking because Justice Scalia came to the Supreme Court 
as a known real conservative, whereas Justice Ginsburg, when Bill Clinton appointed her, was sort of a, basically viewed as a moderate. Um, mm -hmm. She had done these things for women's rights. No one was really paying attention to women's rights. Like people thought of her as like, you know, and when she had been a DC appeals court judge, she, was, she wasn't considered a, a radical firebrand by any stretch. Right. So I don't know, I don't know what to say. We, we, know she, we know she wouldn't have wanted the nomination. She didn't want the nomination to take place at all. Um, beyond that, uh, Justice Ginsburg was a, an optimist her whole life. So I'm sure she would be hoping optimistically that um, now Justice Coney Barrett will evolve in her thinking on many issues. Right, and and I think uh, that you, interesting that you bring up Scalia because they had they were you know they were at the opposite ends of the spectrum. Let's just say, uh, oftentimes in their political viewpoints, but they were very very good friends, as you all um, showcase in in the movie. So it, it is interesting, Julie, that you say that perhaps perhaps what she did mean was you know a difference across perhaps political spectrums, not necessarily color, right, per se, but, um, and it seemed that she very much always had a level head about things where there's law and then there's what she would consider right and wrong, but then there was also respect about how others felt about the law. And I, I, I think, you know, again, I do think it's interesting that her replacement was, is a woman, right? So there's, so there's that part of it. But then there's that other part where I'm just like, but it's very interesting because it's it's a woman who has you know very opposing viewpoints. So you're winning on one hand from an RBG perspective, right? And then on the other hand, I you know in my mind I always think I wonder what she's thinking, you know, kind of right now because it's like we won on that piece, but I would have liked to win on both both checks. But um, you know we'll we'll never really know. I just wanted to see if you all had any any insight on that as since we are in the moment right now. And when you did the film and the film came out in 2018, right? So it um, was at Sundance in 2018, but you started in 2015? Yeah, but the idea, we floated the idea with her in 2015, you know, long before, uh, you know, Donald Trump had even, announced as a uh, as a candidate or was a, was a viable candidate in any way and i think at that time you know justice ginsburg probably imagined that um hillary clinton would be uh, replacing her would be naming her replacement successor right right so um we are at the 945 mark uh, I don't see too many questions yet in the chat. So again, I encourage everyone to add a question to the chat that you would like to ask our panelists in our last 15 minutes. I, I wanted to ask you all um, a question. So RBG was unable to secure a job as, as, the, as the film um, went over. She was unable to secure a job in a firm even after graduating top of her class in Columbia Law School and making law review her second year at, at, at Harvard Law, right? So of course that then led to her career as a, um, as a professor, as a law professor and a position as a litigator for the Women's Rights Project for the ACLU, right? So she'd worked as um, on the legal team that persuaded the high court to rule for the first time that in 1970, a state had violated the constitution by denying women equal treatment. So my point is this sort of started RBG's, I guess, legacy. Her, it pivoted her into a direction where this was kind of where she was going to make her, her, her legal mark. And she had said in an interview, in a, 20, in a 2007 interview, Suppose there had been a Wall Street firm interested in hiring me. What would I be today? And her answer was a retired partner. And I thought that was extremely profound. In other words, sometimes the road less traveled by, to, to quote my favorite Robert Frost poem, the road less traveled by is what actually makes us who we are today. And had she have, had she have just kind of been scooped up right by a firm um that you know she wouldn't maybe she wouldn't be 
where she is today. So um, what do you all think about that sort of as, I guess, almost as advice for people out there listening that oftentimes we think that, and RBG said this off, you know, she, she, she never looked at anything with anger and she almost took sort of everything as an opportunity. How, what lesson can people learn from RBG, um, particularly now when we are in trying times with COVID and things of that nature and, you know, jobs and, you know, we're all having our own issues. What do you all think that people can sort of take from that for their own? You know, I, I think it's a very profound lesson that sometimes the very worst thing that happens to you can turn out to have a good outcome. Uh, and that's something, as Julie said, that, that Justice Ginsburg was a very optimistic person. And, you know, she may have been depressed to not be able to use her brain in some, you know, in the service of people who are hiring some high powered law firm, but she quickly found a way to use that great brain as an academic and then, you know, a, as a litigator on behalf of women. And, you know, she found that it didn't come to her right away it was really as the women's movement was was picking up and her students her female students were coming to her and saying hey you know we want a course on women in the law and then she started looking into it and she realized not much has been done and women are treated as second class citizens and um it quickly it changed her focus but that happened over time if you think about it that she you know, got out of uh, law school in the early 60s, and it was in the late 60s, so some years went by when she really developed this uh, specialty. And so I think for younger people, um, thinking about the frustrations that you're facing, you know, obviously now with COVID and so many difficulties that it is important to remember that things can change and that opportunities can open up in the in the midst of even a disaster. Absolutely. Michaela, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that Justice Ginsburg is a great example of following your own passions and interests, even in the face of adversity. I think that um, it's an example also of being able to, like you said, go on the path less traveled and do something different. You don't always have to go into what everyone expects you to do or what you know society may expect you to do um, particularly as a woman <clears throat> i think it's important to stay true to your own values and your own passions and if you're interested in something then maybe that once you get that law degree the big law route may not be of interest to you i mean there are so many different opportunities and so many different things that someone can do after they leave and, and get their degree. So I think that it's about looking at what's important to you and knowing that that might not always be apparent immediately, as I don't think it was for Justice Ginsburg, but eventually pursuing what you're interested in, seeing where you see some of the loopholes in our society and what piques your interest and what, what do you want to advocate for, whether you're a lawyer or whether you're in media or journalism or any other industry. But I think that um, particularly for young women, it, it can be important to think about what you are interested in and not what you know society or the school you're attending or whoever thinks that you should be doing um, because there's there's so much out there and that first step in your career can lead you milestones ahead to anything um, as justice ginsburg embodied and i think staying optimistic as well is very important attitude can be so much of it and in, in pushing forward um, particularly now as you said in covid times Absolutely. Okay, so let's take a few questions at this time. We have one from D Danuno. Uh, I don't remember this in the documentary, but what thing or things bothered RBG the most? Hmm. Um, that's a good question, and not one that we've uh, been asked. I mean, you know, she certainly, she certainly got irritated. I would say bipartisanship. We, you know. We had a, you know, the, the, the film delved into her close friendship with Justice Scalia. And um, there was a fair amount of kind of backlash to that part of her story. There were a lot of people just like, including someone, one of her friends who's in the story, like, I, I just don't get it. Like, how could you hang out with Justice Scalia? 
and she she really disliked that kind of attitude. She 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 wanted people to find common ground where it was possible, even even while being like so you know deeply and dearly attached to causes that we associate and that are you know progressive causes she still really wanted there to be you know I interaction across the aisle it feels like that's getting more more and more difficult now in a, in a way that uh, you know it's just it's just it's just hard hard to think how one brings her feelings and lessons into the into our current environment which feels like it gets more and more divided including on issues related to her own legacy so it's a it's a kind of a really complicated uh, issue you know i think in a way um you can take the attitude she had which was sparring with this super smart funny, witty, intellectual justice friend that she had helped sharpen her her arguments. And they frequently did that where they, you know, uh, would, would have discussions that she felt helped make her arguments better. I mean, she had such a strong and powerful and simple response to the originalist point of view, which is now, you know, in the majority on the Supreme Court, which is that when the Constitution was written, we the people did not include women, did not include African Americans, indigenous people. And so our definitions of the Constitution have evolved, and that is the reason why she had a different view of the Constitution than, let's say, originalists. I think, you know, it was a very simple, plain explanation that I think she, I'd like to think maybe she developed it in having uh, debates with, uh, with Justice Scalia. Absolutely. Well, we actually do have a question about um, different political viewpoints. So from, from Phil, through the, lens, <clears throat> RBG's, through the lens of RBG's life philosophies, how can individuals today work to better understand those with different political viewpoints, especially when those people are close friends and family? So oh. any one of the three of you can, can take this one on. I'm gonna sit back. <laughs> I'll, I'll take this one. <laughs> Um, I think that it starts with, I think in some ways it starts with recognizing that others are going to have a different point of view at a very basic level. Um, but I think that Justice Ginsburg really embodied the spirit of a healthy debate um, in her friendship with Justice Scalia. And that's really the essence of the First Amendment and the concept of a marketplace of ideas, being able to discuss and disagree and disagree without being disagreeable um, in some ways. But I think that in today's climate, it's extremely difficult to have some of these conversations because these are really hot topic issues that are going on in our country right now. Um, the election is a very intense election. And I think it's going to take empathy from everyone to understand other types of people and their point of view and recognizing that this kind of diversity of thought is what hopefully gets us to a, a common place and a, some sort of truth among us all. But I think at the end of the day, there will always be differences in opinions and we have to recognize that and do what we can to advocate for our point of view while also understanding that other people will think differently and we do the best we can to get the, the outcome that we can for, um, for what we want. Fantastic. You know, Thanks. she found common ground in music and art with people. You know, that was the basis of her friendship with Justice Scalia, also in laughing because he was a funny guy. She loved to laugh, but they just really bonded about opera because they were both opera nuts. And I think that was very important to her the the arts mm -hmm. absolutely i i loved um philip not to, to be to, trying to engage with his family his family and friends of different and perhaps go with perhaps listen to go some on. with them or yeah, go listen to some music <laughs> right they'll listen to some music during thanksgiving yeah. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Put on, put on whatever it is that you can all agree. It's it. Very loud. <laughs> That's funny. I think we have time for one more, depending on, on the answer. So um, this is specifically for Julie and Betsy. Can you talk about the process of making the documentary a reality? Um, and, and how was it interact with, with RBG? What, what, did, what did you learn about her that we should all learn? Well, I'm going to turn this back into what Michaela was talking about earlier about career, uh, you know, not getting pinned down by setbacks, etc. When, when, when you mentioned we first approached uh, Justice Ginsburg in 2015, her initial answer wasn't like, hey, great, make a documentary about us. Like, when are the cameras coming? Like that. That's, and, that's, and that's actually rarely how good things in life work. Her answer was not yet. We took that as a maybe. And we followed her lead and kind of going step by step and gradually worming our way in to her world to the point where we were making a documentary about her. And I actually think that's actually how, how most valuable projects, whether they be in film or you know so, so many other other areas of endeavor come about. It's not like nothing's, it's not just like, hey, great, come on in and you know, it's like, if you really, really want to try to do something, you've got to strategize and put a lot of work and thought into how to uh, incrementally make it happen. Absolutely. And in terms of what it was like to work with her, totally intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> You know, she was a tiny woman, but she was a force to be dealt with. And every time, especially at the beginning, we were a nervous wreck meeting with her and just wanting to make sure that our words were correct, that we didn't sound like bumbling idiots. And, um, you know, but we knew that we just had this goal in mind. We knew it was going to make a really strong and powerful documentary, kept that in mind, and we just kept going overcame our uh, intimidation. I, I can only imagine. I, 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 was, I was intimidated for you watching it. <laughs> yeah. what, I mean, what would I do? Uh, and you even had some reaction from, from, from fans and they're like, oh my God, she's coming in. I'm so excited to meet her. I don't know, you know, I don't know how to, how to handle it. She, she really did become, um, she became a celebrity, and I don't mean in, in the sense of, you know, because she obviously also, all Supreme Court justices have our celebrity ask, right, by definition, but she became a celebrity, a different kind of celebrity. Um, and, and it was really just so incredible to watch. So we are in our last minute. So I just want to thank all of our panelists today for being here. Um, Julie Cohen, Betsy West, and Michaela Parsons Wickham. I also want to thank you all very much for taking the time this morning or this afternoon, again, depending on where you are in the U.S., to be with us today to learn more about the legend, the life of the notorious RBG. So I want to say thank you so much. We are concluding our morning today, and I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful day and stay safe. Thank, Thank you very you much, Lisa. That was nice to meet you, Michaela. So nice to meet you both.